what's up goldie here and i'm gonna once again hopefully quickly be going over the 12 game main slate we have here on tuesday uh, august 22 um <clears throat> i have a um some some calls booked today so hopefully be able to get through things uh relatively quickly really only one questionable spot here with oakland uh they haven't officially announced anybody yet uh, i've got hogan harris in here that's probably who it's going to be whether that is in a traditional starter capacity or as a long reliever um everybody else though looks like we're all good uh, we don't have to deal with the one debut today and i believe kyle anderson for the um or kyle harrison excuse me for the uh, giants that's on the turbo slip so we do have projections and ownership loaded as you can see here not a lot of you know, really, um, you know, big bright green numbers, just a couple of spots. You know, the expensive guys, for the most part, are in kind of difficult matchups, right? Verlander gets uh, Boston, Gallon gets Texas, Blake Snell at 10-7, which is mega expensive here. Bailey Ober, expensive for him as well, 10-2, that's not fantastic. Jesus Luzardo gets a Padres. Uh, Giolito and Graham Ashcraft in the um, resumption, so to speak, uh, or the, the makeup, as it were, of the game that was canceled yesterday. Um, yeah, pretty much the same analysis. We'll kind of you know, briefly go over that. Uh, Rodon is back tonight. He gets Washington, seeing a lot of ownership here in the mid-range. Kind of questionable there for me, at least. Uh, everywhere else, I think you just kind of mix in a lot of guys. You know, you got some playable spots down here, um, and... I think you can mix in uh, a bunch of different guys here. You can get really contrarian on the mound today if you need to, uh, because there's a couple of offenses I think we're probably going to want to play, and they're kind of expensive. So um, that said, let's just get into it here, and uh, we will start with Washington and New York. JoJo Gray going for the Nationals, really questionable here. It's hard for me to get too excited about JoJo anymore. It's just a walks, man. Can't throw it past left-handers, um, and... Well, he can't really throw it near them either. 14% walk rate in aggregate, just a 20% strikeout rate is questionable too. So he's got trouble throwing, eh, not necessarily strike one, but it strikes two and three for sure. Um, you know, the barrel rate's fine, and he does stay down in the strike zone to right-handers a little bit, but he's he's attackable with some contact um, in the air, at least, uh, to the lefties. 075 ground ball to fly ball there. And he'll give up some batting average to the right-handers, too. So um, you could find a Yankee stack. Overall, though, the offense, just they just stink, man. They're so terrible. Um, so I don't really want to get super excited playing a lot of these guys. I mean, Stanton's 4,300. The price kind of jumps out at you. Uh, Judge, obviously, at 62. It's it's whatever. Glaber's still at 42. You know, these are playable price tags. Jake Bauer's fine. Um, hits a lot of fly balls, though. So not super thrilled with that. A bad ball matchup necessarily for him. Um, you know, they're calling up a, a young outfield prospect, Everson Pereira, today, are the Yankees. He's 2,000 in the outfield. Um, so, you know, he'll make the, the judge price tag a little more uh, palatable for you. It's okay. I just don't like playing the Yankees anymore. I don't think they're very good, and really they should just be relegated to the freaking AAA. They're, they're just bad. Um so that said, they're probably going to you know, really b kind of blow up against JoJo here today. He does walk people, and it puts stacks in play in that respect. But, like, for the most part, it just gives up a 250 XBA, um, 335 X Woban, 165 X ISO, despite a depressed, you know, three ticks below average strikeout rate here, just 20%. Hard contact's great. Soft contact is really, really good. So I don't want to go out of my way to be playing a Stanton who... It, you know, strikes out playing wiffle ball. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I guess most people do. In any case, not a good offense over here for the Yankees, uh, especially when Judge is not going. Um, the rest of these guys are just very unimpressive. So, does that put JoJo in play? I think a lot of the upside for him is capped, though, at 6,900. So, not thrilled about playing him. If you land on a couple of these JoJo teams, I wouldn't totally argue with you. I mean, I'd probably make you give me a, a pretty good explanation, but... Um, yeah, it, it's all right. I think upside for him, probably 22 points or something here. It's just a surviving matchup, uh, for the most part for JoJo. Um, 
you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if he gets tagged for a couple of runs, and he might have a little bit of trouble making that back up in terms of just raw strikeout stuff here against the Yankees. Carlos Rodon, 7,800. I like the price tag. I do not like the matchup, number one, because he gets the Nationals, right? And I do not like the underlying metrics here so far for Rodon. He's been bad, right? Where's the strikeout stuff? He's uh, 21% in the six appearances this season, 15% walk rate, 57% strike one. Like, are we kidding? Yeah, yeah, the chase is there, some of the swing strike stuff, but, I mean, he's got a CSW right now of 24%. Um, he's been tagged, right? It's because he's putting way too many people on base for free. 15% walk rate, you cannot do this. I know we have a short sample for the guy, but uh, I'm not going to screw around with a team that is going to make a lot of contact. They hit for a 277 batting average as a team over 1,500 PAs this season, 107 WRC+. plus. They create against left-handed pitching, 18.5% strikeout rate. This is like Houston territory. This team is very, very strong. And, well, I mean, not from a, a raw run creation and power upside DFS perspective, but from a contact perspective, they're incredibly difficult to get through. And if you're d unable to throw strikes, um, like, I don't want to deal with this, especially 25% ownership. Now, I, I do like the price tag. I do like Rodone's overall upside. But look at the platoon split here. So far, 26% K rate against lefties. Yeah, it's great. But a 20% K rate against righties. That's where the power is really coming from. I mean, you can't take a lot of 20 hitters in a 350 ISO or whatever. You know, the homer numbers are inflated. All of this is just short, short sample noise for the most part. But he's still got to prove to me that he's got to, he could throw strike one and throw strikes two and three as well. Um, so I don't really want to be eating a lot of ownership on a guy it feels quite trappy to me here. Um, do you want to play some leverage Washington pieces? I don't think this is bad. Lane Thomas, 52, is kind of you know egregiously expensive. Joey Manessa, same thing, 4,800. It's kind of insane. These guys have been better recently, but like let's not get carried away. Stone Garrett is out of the 2000s. He's 3,600, though. Uh, he hits ground balls, and Carlos Rodon's always been a fly ball pitcher. Um, so Stone Garrett, I think, is... Against left-handers, um, he's he'll lift the baseball quite a bit. Um, I say he hits ground balls, but um, he'll hit ground balls compared to the number of fly balls that Rodone generally gives up uh, against right-handers. So um, he's got you know roughly a, I mean he's got a fly ball lean. Stone Garrett, um, but he's still at a very playable 36. Under. He's got killer numbers against left-handers. So I want to be really careful with the Rodone exposure. I don't want to go nuts with it, and I probably uh, will come in way, way under, building a ton of teams here, and I might just X him, uh, depending on who else you know I, I land on in the in the mid-range. I, I don't trust it. Um, you know, sometimes this, this will burn me, but this is a horrible strikeout matchup. This is a, still a 12-game slate, so I want to be careful with this. Um, you know, Riley Adams behind the plate. Think I think you could find a three-man... You know, Washington stack here. I don't want to go with a full five man, but if his ownership steams, I mean, that puts full five mans in play just from a leverage perspective. So I think Washington is very playable here. You're getting three to two on them in the betting markets. I don't think that's bad at all as a punt. Rodone is susceptible here, and you know, maybe if you could get a little bit higher than a raw three to two plus 150, yeah, okay. I'd see if you could chase that, but. I want to be careful with it a little bit. Okay, let's move on. Toronto and Baltimore. Yusei Kikuchi kind of made me look like an idiot in his last appearance as well. Um, he was fine at whatever, 9,000, 9, I think he was. He's 8,900 still. Gets another really difficult matchup here. And he still gives a pop to the right-handers. 175 ISO. Got a 190 X ISO nearly. He's running hot in the realized ISO category to the tune of about a full tick. Um, it's not a lot, but it's not nothing, right? Still 36% hard contact, buck 50 homers per nine, raw 4% home run rate. That's very much attackable still because he gives up that, that hard contact at 35% in aggregate with neutral ground balls per fly ball. So from a, a batting average standpoint and, and pure base runner standpoint, um, maybe a little bit hard to attack here, but Baltimore is a very good offense against left-handed pitching. Buck 12 WRC plus, 21.5% K rate, nearly a 10% walk rate at 9.5 here. 180 ISO nearly, some hard contact, about average clip, 34%. But they can lift it a little bit, 
strong 37% fly ball rate. You know, it's buck 20 ground ball to fly ball ratio. Um, but they've got some some hitters over here from the right side, notably Ryan Mountcastle, Anthony Santander is great from the right side. Austin Hayes, fantastic numbers against lefties this year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That can lift it. Rutch hits from the right side. I mean, he's 5,400. Still kind of an egregious price tag due to his very high walk rate. Um, we don't really have to worry about walks necessarily with Kikuchi. The control is still pretty good. And overall, he's far better this year than he has than he was last year. But still a little bit attackable. So I want to be careful with this. I do like the very low ownership. I think there's some upside that you could squeeze out of that number in particular. But I'm questioning the price tag uh, in conjunction with that. So in this particular matchup, I'm just I'm likely to stay off of this. Um, I don't really trust the guy to be quite honest, in this particular matchup. So I like Baltimore a little bit. I think you could find some Baltimore stacks, short stacks, I think, are in play. And I think you could probably find a, a full Baltimore stack if you uh, if you tried pretty hard. Grayson on on the mound for um, Baltimore here. Like He's 6,100. I love this price tag for him. I hate this matchup, of course. Uh, and we talk about this a lot with, you know, with Toronto. Like, they're a super difficult offense to get through with right-handed pitching or left-handed pitching for that matter. Uh, 22% strikeout rate, super hard, 105 WRC plus. They just don't hit for a lot of power, right? But they don't strike out a lot, and it makes them, you know, super difficult. That said, Jer Grayson Rodriguez, 6,100. I love the price tag. I'm fine with 15% ownership here, I think, because if this value scored north of 30 down at this price range, uh, I think it's kind of a steal. He gives up power to left-handers, despite the very good change and the very good slide. Like, we're seeing the, the change of value increase more and more. And as he's getting better value on the four-seamer here, um, we're going to continue to see this change up uh, spike really, really hard. And the production against left-handers will come down considerably. Uh, still hard contact there, though, at 40% in the aggregate. But some ground balls so we could stomach a little bit of hard contact. You just got to keep it out of the air and keep it from going over the wall, which has really been his problem. He's also got a raw 4% homer rate. I think the run totals here in this game might be a little fishy low. You could maybe squeeze an over out of this game, an over 8. Um, if you could find an over 7.5, I mean, that seems like a steal. But, um, you know, it, I think offensively due to the holes that these guys have in their arsenals you could find uh like there could be a route here for either offense to get there um i generally don't like taking full stacks in this ballpark anymore but i think it's okay i do kind of want to get to a little bit of grace in here 6100 i think the price tag is just going to keep him in play because he's so good against the right side right 34 percent hard contact at a buck twenty-five ground balls per fly ball is fine. He'll give up some line drives there, but it's not, you know, um, sort of hard contact in the air type of line drives. It's sort of like bloop line drives, and it doesn't really translate to homers and power, right? Buck forty-five realized ISO with one point one homers per nine to the righties. Still a twenty-five percent strikeout rate. He's got upside here because the slider is still really good, also. You know, he just needs to continue to establish with the four seamer, really develop the cutter a little bit more. Um, this pitch will get better because the slider is good, and he's still got the excellent change. So I think he can neutralize some of these high strikeout bats from the left side for sure, like Brandon Belt, Dalton Varsho. Uh, Kevin Kiermeyer's back, so he will be a little bit of a stick in the mud. But some of these right-handers, too, um, they'll still hit ground balls, right? And I'm not super thrilled about playing ground ball hitters against ground ball pitchers that have whiffs. And don't give up a lot of production. There's some average there that could be found for Toronto. So Baltimore would be my favorite offensive stack if we get there. Um, with some, maybe even some correlated teams and, and Grayson Rodriguez, then get to another maybe secondary expensive stack or an expensive arm or something. I think it's a playable construction that you could very reasonably explore here today. All right, St. Louis and Pittsburgh. Um, Wainwright, absolutely not. He's just been dreadful the whole season. I don't care about the price tag. He's got to be like 2200 for me to consider playing him at these numbers. 87% contact, 12% strikeout rate, 54% strike one, 22%, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're looking for maybe some suppression regression to come for him, but he's still got expected suppression numbers north of six. 
So that there's just no chance that this happens. Uh, for me, it's he's in X immediately. Um, even against Pittsburgh, who is, you know, for the most part a below average offense against righty, I don't really care. Wayne Wright at this point in in his career, like he should be throwing, like high school games, and he might still get beat, get picked apart there. Uh, there's just no swing and miss anymore. The curveball's bad now. Um, two seamers bad. Cut like literally everything about. Every single metric here is terrible. Um, outside of the walk rate, he still has control for the most part. So he's not putting people on base for free, which is good. The problem is he's, he's just letting them, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he is putting them on for free because he's just serving up the baseball at 85 miles an hour. So uh, total non-starter here. Pirates are once again in, in play. Um, maybe probably less so since this is a 12-game slate compared to yesterday's 8-game slate. But... Yeah, they'll still garner a lot of ownership. You still got to balance that, but they're still, they're still cheap. Are you going to need to get all the way down to Pittsburgh, you know, a secondary or a, a primary cheap stack like this? Um, yeah, perhaps not because, I mean, I don't know. We'll talk about the expensive arms on the mound. I'm not really thrilled about pretty much any of them today. Um, so are you going to need to get down here, you know, with a full stack? Maybe not. Um, I mean, yeah, there are constructions that will obviously make that happen, but, I'm not super jacked about full five-man Pittsburgh stacks today uh, nearly as much as I was yesterday. So, you know, do we want to get to everybody? I mean, sure, go ahead. It, it doesn't matter because Wainwright's contact profile here against any team in baseball right now is just – there's no reason that he should be anywhere near the starting rotation. He should be on the pitching staff. Uh, these numbers are just too bad. Um, it's uh, – he can survive maybe. Like, he's going five and six innings. Maybe he'll survive and only give up three or four runs, but, um, you know, he, from a DFS perspective, like, you just attack him every single day with whatever you want, and you don't go near him on the mound. So, uh, Yohan Oviedo's going for the Pirates, 73, yeah, all right, the price tag, I think, is going to put him in play a little bit. Ownership is corroborating that a little at, um, you know, sub-5% here. Gives up power to the lefty, so I want to be concerned, or I want to be careful there, rather, like an Alec Burleson. Um... But really, I mean, they got Richie Palacios down at the bottom of the lineup. Maybe some Tommy Edmond here that'll switch hit a little bit. But uh, they're missing Nolan Gorman because he's dealing with the back. They're very right-handed heavy outside of that. And he's pretty damn good for all intents and purposes against the right side because he's got fine slider value here at break even relative to league average. And then really good curveball value. That's where the swing and miss is coming from. Uh, for Oviedo, it's the fastball that leaves it on the table for him a little bit. Doesn't really have a lot of a change, but he's got it. Um, he can survive here, and we saw yesterday, for example, how bad the Cardinals' offense can be on occasion. Um, I'd still like to play some Cardinals here and go after Oviedo because a below-average fastball mix um, you know, is, is still kind of attackable. I, I think... I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll land on him a little bit, probably not near 10% or so, but you know, sprinkle in five, eight teams or something like that out of 10, or um, you know, anywhere uh, out of 100, rather. Anywhere in that sort of range, I think, is, is probably okay, uh, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Gives up pop to the lefties, as I mentioned. So I do like an Alec Burleson here, and you can always play Goldsmith, Arenado, um, that's pretty fine, to be quite honest. You can play a little Wilson Contreras behind the plate or a Jordan Walker, Tyler O'Neill guys in the outfield. They'll hit some ground balls, though, so I'm not super thrilled about it. Big soft contact rate, low hard contact rate, sub-30%, sub-28% for Oviedo against righties. So not super jacked about playing a lot of the Cardinals, but a couple short stacks here or there could very much be found. Still a tough ballpark over here in PNC. So um, very little pitching, maybe a little Oviedo, and some Pittsburgh for sure. Okay, Dodgers, Cleveland, give me all the Dodgers here. Um, maybe not so much Bobby Miller. I, I really like this kid, though, man. Throws hard. He's got a lot of velo. And he's got five pitches going to work with, and every one of them so far in the 14 starts could be 15 because I'm still dealing with the um, aggregate shenanigans. Um, I'd, all the numbers here are, are pretty good outside of the raw swinging strikes and the raw strikeout rate, right? Walk rate is good. Strike one is great like a little bit more chase out of him, but he's relying heavily on a, a sinker here. It's not really the swing and miss pitch, right? 
uh, not a chase pitch or anything. It just keeps him down in the strike zone, uh, certainly against the right side where he's inducing buck 80 ground balls per fly ball. Giving up hard contact there, uh, but for the most part inducing some soft as well, and it's a lot of rollover type of hard ground ball contact. So we can stomach that a little bit. But pushing 40%, we do still have to um, you know, kind of be aware of that. 270 batting average is not nothing to the right-hander. So we got to be aware of that. There's just no power, right? 105 ISO allowed, 22% strikeout rate. It's mostly a serviceable sort of finesse type of arm here uh, because he's so hard down in the strike zone at 99 and 100. Against left-handers, it's where he's a little bit more attackable from a power perspective. He's got more strikeout stuff, though, because he has the curveball change and the four-seamer to a certain extent that go to work there. So overall, I think he's fine. This is a horrible strikeout matchup for him, however, and with just the 22.5% aggregate rate, I think it, he might struggle to reach uh, pure strikeout upside, but I don't see a problem at all with him being able to induce a hell of a lot of ground balls because most of the Guardians over here, and even though they traded away half of the roster, still hit ground balls. Buck 30 ground ball per fly ball in aggregate this season. Obviously, this is not going to totally reflect the trades, etc., etc., but 27% hard contact and a 130 ISO. 18.5% K rate and a 260 batting average. So they could get some contact out of him um, and hit for a little bit of average in this spot, but they're not going to hit for power. Right, so I think that has to put Bobby Miller in play. At 86, I'm a little concerned with upside, um, but you want to play correlated teams at super low ownership with him. I think that's very much playable because I want to play all of the Dodgers and as much of the Dodgers as I can. I do not respect no Syndergaard here. Uh, he pitches to 83% contact. Um, it would, it would, it's just way too high, right? He doesn't throw it past anybody, and this is the Dodgers. You cannot pitch to this much contact against them, and despite the fact that he's got six pitches, um, really none of them are any good. I mean, maybe maybe the show-me slider, slight plus value on the four-seamer. He's always had an okay four-seamer, um, you know, but the swing and miss is totally gone for him anymore. He is a finesse guy that gives up a lot of power, 220x ISO. He's running perhaps a little bit cold to the tune of about 2.5%, so maybe some positive regression here, but you want to go searching for that against the Dodgers and this contact profile? I certainly don't, so be my guest. Way too much batting average, way too many base runners, not because of walks. So this is all contact and and power, right? He'll give up a full 5% homer rate. It's to both sides of the plate. Um, I want nothing to do with Syndergaard. No pitching from Cleveland's perspective here for me. Give me some Dodge. Give me all the Dodgers. They're going to be the most popular team today up there with probably Atlanta. Um but I don't particularly care. I think they are the best stack. If you can make price tags happen, uh, and you really can. Max Muncy's only 47 here today. Will Smith down to 56. It's still not fantastic, but cheaper than the 6,000 or wherever he's been. 61 for Freddie and 64 for Mookie. You got to pay for these these guys up at the top. JD's 5,000. That's still a playable price. And you still have all of the guys down at the bottom who are all under 3,000. I mean, James out went 3,400. Whatever. So whoever they throw in there down at the bottom, they're similar to Atlanta. You just got to balance the top, um, you know, three, four guys, whatever. To get to full Dodger stacks, you're going to have to double punt on the mound probably, maybe even play like a cheap Pittsburgh three-man or something like that, uh, play a Grayson or something. I think it's a viable construction and one I may very well consider today because I want to get as much of the Dodgers as I can. And frankly, you only have to lay two to one on into betting markets uh, with them right now. Kind of seems like a cheap price on first glance, to be honest. All right, let's move on. Um, I also, I guess quickly we'll go back to Cleveland. You can play some of these guys here. Josie Ramirez, price tag is kind of jumping off the page at 5400 It's okay, but um, you know maybe a Steven Kwan, maybe an Andres Jimenez. I don't really want to deal with most of this, though. Uh, you're going to have to look for guys that have neutral ground ball to fly ball profiles um, or that can lift it. And that's really like a Jose Ramirez, um, I mean, potentially a Bo Naylor, something like that. You know, not overly thrilling for the most part. Now let's move on to the Mets and Atlanta. Tyler McGill, 5,800. Nice price tag. Horrible matchup. So no thanks. 11% walk rate, 17% K rate. Um, I, I don't want to deal with this. He's got 95, so a little bit of gas here. But just a 6 and 7 mile an hour below Delta um, uh, on the changeup to the four-seamer. Need more. 
to suppress a lot of production against left-handers and induce more swing and miss. He gives up a 291 XBA too, uh, really to that's to both sides of the plate. 380 X Woba buoyed somewhat by the 11% walk rate, but still a hell of a lot of contact too. 17.5% aggregate K rate. No thanks. Problems throwing strike one. No chase. No swinging strikes. 24% CSW. Uh, batted ball wise, a little bit more attackable to you know give up uh, balls in the air here to left-handers. From a right-handed perspective, you want you know, fly ball hitters and from the right side. Um, probably staying off of Marcelo Zuna and his token two-homer game today because he hit two yesterday. Can't really expect that to happen again. Uh, Sean Murphy hits the ball in the air a little bit. Uh, 5200 price finally coming down because he's been dreadful over the last two months. Uh, Austin Riley still 58. Ronald Acuna, of course, 67. Still no problems there. Um, you know, and they're expensive. You know, so you got to balance Michael Harris up at in the two hole. I think he's fine. 4,700, high ground ball hitter. You know, McGill's going to give up some line drives here, so I think uh, Michael Harris is fine. Um, and then of course Eddie Rosario should be back in. I, I like Eddie here in this spot at 4,000. So he'd probably price adjust to be my favorite from the Braves here today. And I think he's probably well, he's not popping the hardest in value, but he probably should be. Uh, so no McGill for me. Bryce Elder, 83. All right, the price tag is going to put him in play. The matchup is kind of going to put him in play simply because the Mets aren't all that great, even though they took off uh, against Winans yesterday. Um, I am fine mixing in a little Bryce Elder here, but I'm still looking for more negative regression to the kid. Expected metrics, you know, pointing still a run higher. Um, and despite the ground ball stuff, you still can't throw it past anybody. And I'm expecting you know, further negative regression to come for him. So uh, I'll probably minimize my exposure here. I don't like the strikeout matchup. I think the contact here that he's going to pitch to at 79, 80% nearly is uh, a little bit concerning. Um, I don't really want to play any of the right-handers. It would only be Pete Alonso. Uh, but he kind of has a, a little bit of a ground ball lean. Not going to strike out, so Frankie Alvarez from the right side it, it's probably all right in addition to pd um you know nimmo's fine at 46 frankie lindor kind of expensive at 53 but it, you know it's okay you could find some mets to go after some bryce elder um so that i guess kind of by default has to put him in play a little bit slightly attractive price tag it kind of jumped at me uh when i first saw it here today so i think that's playable not overly thrilling uh, for the most part correlated teams with bryce elder as he is a little bit cheaper i think that's okay um, but for the most part, just uh, just some offense here and pretty little pitching. All right, Minnesota and the Brewers, Bailey over, 10-2, kind of expensive for him, uh, kind of worrisome. I do like going after the Brewers. Uh, they did just get Rowdy Telez back, who's a lower strikeout bat. Hopefully, I mean, he's 2,000 flat, so he's kind of like an auto play at first base in a lot of, in a lot of scenarios um, where you're punting. Because it's not totally a punt. He's got upside at that price, so... It, Bailey Ober's got a lower and depressed strikeout rate, I should say. Um, 21% to the left-handers. Still a lot of fly balls. Not a ton of hard contact here. Just 30% in aggregate. He's mostly pretty serviceable against the left side. Doesn't give up a lot of power uh, because he doesn't give up a lot of hard contact despite the fly balls. Against the righties is really the question mark for him. Is 38% hard contact and 060 ground ball to fly ball. No line drives here, so it's it's fly balls and it's a lot of hard contact. Um, so that's where he's most attackable. 240 ISO realized against the right side. That's uh, very much a, a worrisome figure here when you're eating kind of a high price tag on him. I think there's a little bit of variance, you know, baked in here at 10-2. So I want to be careful. I do really like sub 5% ownership on him in a plus matchup against the Brewers who are just kind of dreadful. 87 WRC plus here for them. 23% strikeout rate. He's still going to strike out right-handers. 140 ISO for the Brewers and a 32% hard contact rate. Uh, his control is good, so we don't have to worry about walks or anything like that. He doesn't really get barreled too terribly. 9% though with that hard contact fly ball rate is a little bit notable. So if you want to take right-handed shots, with the Brewers against Bailey Over, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not thrilled with the price tags, though, to be quite honest. I'd rather just eat it with uh, Rowdy Telez, eat the bad numbers, and 
you know, take a shot at 2,000 or something. So not necessarily my favorite playing offense over here from the Brewers, which kind of puts me on to Bailey over. Um, and certainly at, at low ownership, I think he's a, a pretty damn good tournament play because Blake Snell is going to garner everything above 10,000. Um, so I think this makes him a, a pretty good pivot. Worried about upside a little bit because the Brewers are still going to platoon here. However, from a contact and suppression perspective, buck 13 whip overall is pretty damn good. So I got no problem playing some Bailey over here. It's certainly more than 4%. Wade Miley, no thank you. 63. Uh, I don't really want to do this necessarily. I'm worried about upside on a 12-gamer. On a 17% K rate. I think he needs to be inducing more swing and miss. Um... You know, for me to get really excited, I'd like him a little bit cheaper. I'd much rather just play Grayson Rodriguez, right, at, at 61 in a far worse matchup. I think he's got far more upside. Um, however, that could, you know, if, if Grayson steams a little bit for whatever reason, doubt, doubt he really will against Toronto, uh, you could make a, a price argument pivot, or a price pivot argument, I should say, um, to Wade Miley. But, I mean, do we really want to be going out of our way to do this? Minnesota's still going to platoon very heavily. This is a bad offense, but they're sneaky creating a little bit against left-handers. 90 WRC+, plus, still the strikeouts, right? But a buck 65 ISO, it's a little bit above average. 33% hard contact, average, neutral ground ball to fly ball. 227 batting average, though. Like, that, that's going to make stacks really tough to go after. So I pretty much prefer to homer hunt um, with some right-handers here against Wade Miley. And... You know, that's like a Jordan Luplo. He might be in there. Carlos Correa, eh, maybe 4,600. It's okay. They're cheap enough to make this happen. Ryan Jeffers, uh, I think, is is okay here. A bit more of a fly ball hitter compared to Christian Vasquez. Michael Taylor is a fine outfield piece. I think that's fine. Um, you could find some, you know, Royce Lewis is you know, fine, whatever. You could find some twins here, but overall, this is a bad offense. But I don't really trust Wade Miley to achieve a hell of a lot of upside. Maybe 18, 20 points here. Um, but is he really – like you're sacrificing win equity, I think, because you know Bailey Ober, I think, is going to be able to keep the Brewers off the board here a little bit. So not overly thrilled with a lot of offense, mostly just some Bailey Ober here for me. All right, Boston-Houston, Tanner Houck. And, um, you know, Houston kind of went off last night. Boston did not. He gets Houston – Tanner Houck does tonight, 7,600. Intriguing price tag kind of jumped at me a little bit. D terrible matchup, so I'm just going to avoid it. Um, with everybody healthy down here in Houston, I don't want anything to do with this. And I'm probably uh, very rarely going to be playing uh, pitchers against them anymore. Jordan Alvarez under 6,059. I really want to go after Tanner Houck with left-handers here. 238 ISO allowed, 262 batting average. That's uh, yeah, it's okay, 23% the average strikeout rate. But um, Jordan and Kyle Tucker don't really strike out all that much. John Singleton, they actually have another left-handed bat in the lineup you could consider as a three-man lefty stack to, you know, at 2,700 for Singleton. It, it'll make the 59-58 for Tucker and, or uh, for Alvarez and Tucker respectively, a little easier to get to. 39% hard contact, two homers per nine to the left-handers. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball, so you want guys that can lift it, um, and that would be Jordan. So I'd much prefer just getting, since they're those two Power hitters, Tucker and Alvarez are expensive. Much prefer to just get to uh, singleton plays of either of them. Maybe uh, singleton <laughs> uh, plays with uh, John Singleton as well. Um, so that's kind of how I'd like to play it here. I don't really want any of the right-handers. 225 batting average were out, allowed, 048 ISO allowed, 2.5 ground balls per fly ball. Um, you know, 28% hard contact here. With the righties, I think at their normal price tags, Altuve at 61, Bregman 53. Yeah, and your Diaz may be a little bit intriguing here. Dual eligible, first and behind the plate uh, at 4,000. Could be interesting. Chas McCormick could be a, a stack piece at 45, but I'm not super thrilled about that necessarily. So mostly just the lefties here for me. Verlander, 95, seeing 15% ownership right now. I think this is okay, but I want to be careful with this because of the sub-20% strikeout rate. Uh really to both sides. I mean, it's 20% in aggregate. Um, whoops. There we go. 20% in aggregate, sub-20 to the left-handers. Really not giving up a lot of power anymore. Earlier in the season, much more attackable with the right-handers, giving up more fly balls and more hard contact, as he has been wont to do pretty much his entire career. Strike one is still a question for me here at 54%. The chase is good. 
but the swing strikes are sub 10%. So I want to be careful with this. 26% CSW. This is still a good offense over here, even though, uh, you know, they didn't really hop on the Houston bullpen after Javier kind of chit the bed a little bit. Uh, so Verlander's okay. All right. You know, 9,500, not super thrilled about the price tag necessarily. Questioning upside, but... Um, I could very reasonably see 22, 25 points out of him with a little bit of win equity here. Uh, they are 3-2 to two in the betting markets, which seems like a fine price. Um, not a ton of value to squeeze out of that from a betting perspective, but from uh, an equity perspective for Verlander on the mound, I think that's probably pretty okay. So do I want to play some some Boston over here. You can always play Devers. Devers. Justin Turner got a day off yesterday, kind of frustratingly. Uh, 4,600. I think that is all right. Verlander still gives up fly balls. So some of these, um, so some of these, you know, left-handers are, you know, from a, a ground ball perspective, uh, I think is, they're very playable, like a Mostaki Yoshida, uh, at 4,600. Um, I, I think this is a, a really playable price and a, a fine batted ball matchup because from a to the left side, oh, 70 ground balls per fly ball for Verlander. That matches up with Yoshida pretty damn well because he hits, you know, damn near as many fly or ground balls as Tim Anderson. For example, uh, Devers, of course, at 55. I like the price tags over here. Tristan Casas as well. He's a fly ball hitter. A little questionable there. Still in play from a uh, contact perspective because his problem is really walks and strikeouts. Verlander's control is overall still pretty good. Um, so at, at just an 8% walk rate, we don't really have to worry about that with Cassis necessarily. And that puts him in play at 4,300. But you got to choose between him and Justin Turner. I think I'd rather play Justin Turner here. But, you know, either of them are, are perfectly fine. Jaron Duran probably going to be back tonight as well. So really the top seven, I think, are all really in play. If you want to throw in a very cheap Connor Wong, doesn't hit for any average, probably going to strike out a lot. But he's 2300 uh, behind the plate. I think that's fine, too. Boston, an intriguing uh, tournament stack here once again. I think you could very reasonably get to them in maybe some 20 max, but you could play some Verlander in some 20 max as well. All right, let's move on to Seattle and the White Sox. Brian Wu is uh, starting for Seattle today. Um, now, he was out and hurt. I forget exactly what it was. Looking it up right here. Yeah, in a forearm. Um it was slightly inflamed there, so I want to be careful going forward with uh, with some Brian Wu. I hate forearm injuries uh, with with pitchers; um, they're quite ominous. And you know, even though some inflammation, you know, just put him down for a little while, and it was only inflammation, they're comfortable letting him go again. Uh, well, I still don't trust it because we've seen you, know, you can back test this anytime somebody comes out with forearm inflammation. I mean, just take the uh, take the Tampa Bay Rays, you know, starting rotation this season, for example. I've had five guys or whatever go down with freaking TJ because of forearm problems. So it's a really ominous injury, and I want to be very careful with it when I'm putting any money at risk. Now, 7,600 in this particular matchup from a pure DFS perspective. We're not trying to predict injuries here or anything, but you know, this is something you got to be aware of. Um, from a pure DFS perspective, 7,600 and sub-10% ownership against the White Sox, pretty right-handed heavy team for the most part, is a pretty attractive spot. I think it's playable for him because against right-handers, he's very good in his 11-start sample this season. 137 batting average allowed is elite. 170 WOBA, also elite. Probably see some negative regression come to this. But so far, the numbers are fantastic. 042 ISO, 32% strikeout rate. No walks, heavy ground balls with whiffs, no line drives, 31% soft contact, and a 25% hard contact rate. It's just absolutely incredible elite tier numbers against right-handers for Brian Wu. So if the White Sox go right-handed heavy here tonight, uh, yeah, despite the forearm concerns, I'm going to have some Brian Wu However, they've got five lefties now. Even with the return yesterday of Aloy Jimenez, they can still throw four or even five. They've got five on the roster uh, from the left side of the plate. In the lineup tonight, Andrew Benintendi, Yoan Moncada, Yosemite Grandal, Oscar Colas, and they have Gavin Sheets, right? So um, it's reasonable that they could go 
kind of a five four split here, and then they still have Elvis Andrews, who's not a very high upside. But I mean, you don't want to play any of the right handers here, uh, including Luis Robert at fifty three hundred. No thank you for me. Um, he's going to strike out a lot, and even though he'll get the baseball in the air, like I don't I don't want to go after these types of numbers, even though I do expect negative regression eventually. Um, well, they've only got one good right-handed hitter from a power perspective on over here on the White Sox. So that's how I want to approach Brian Wu today. I need a probably six to three right-handed versus left-handed split to get overly confident with it. If it's five, four, I'm less confident. He's still in play because of the price tag. Uh, but yeah, I really hate the forearm stuff, man. I, um, you know, the forearms turn into elbows, turns into shoulders, turns into, you know, TJ and thoracic outlet. I mean, it, it, it could be really, really bad. Um, so I'm, I'm scarred for having landed on a lot of pitchers with forearm injuries in the past. In any case, like I said, from a pure DFS point of view, it's okay um, to go after the White Sox here because they're still bad offense. 83 WRC plus against righties, 235 batting average, 24% strikeout rate nearly. So, yeah, go ahead. Clevenger is going for them, 6,600. Intriguing price tag here a little bit for Clev. He's been far better in his last several starts. Um, it's the hard contact that really, or hard contact allowed that really keeps him in play. Doesn't really get barreled at just 8% anymore. The control, at 9%. I mean, it's still fine. It's not a horrific figure. It's not Blake Snell at 14% or anything like that. He does give up a lot of fly balls with the lack of excess hard contact. That's what keeps him in play. He can survive. He just doesn't throw it past anybody. So we have upside concerns sometimes with Clevenger. But he, at 6,600, some of that is priced in for us. So I don't have really an issue of playing a little bit of my Clevenger here against a poor offense over here in Seattle. They've been much better. Put up another crooked number yesterday. Uh, whatever. They've had... Plenty of good matchups. He still pitches to contact, and there's going to be contact in the air. So, sure, you can play really any offensive baseball when you've got that uh, working in your favor. But he's still efficient early in the count. There's no chase and no swinging strikes. Um, you know, But to control hard contact is, is still pretty much playable. It'll, it'll give up some pop on occasion to the lefties, but he still induces soft contact there. So it's mostly just like a, you know, he'll you know, pipe a four-seamer or whatever, hang a change-up, and it goes over the wall or something. Um, but overall, the numbers are still pretty damn good. Just a 220 batting average realized against the left side of the plate and sub-250 against the righties. These are good numbers for the most part. The expected metrics for him, 242 XBA, 320 X Wobe, and a 160 X ISO, these are all fine considering he pitches to 81% contact. So I've got no problem with 6,600 playing a Mike Clevenger in some deeper tournament stuff here and taking some shots on a little bit of upside at very low ownership. Um, I think we're kind of, you know, questioning whether, um, you know, he's got the raw upside to hit 30, yeah, but 24 or something is, I think is in the tank and not super probable uh, because of the lack of strikeout stuff. If he gets tagged for a couple runs, which, you know, is very reasonable – might have a, some difficulty making that up, but, uh, you know, it, it's okay. Like, I'm probably actually going to try and build a Clevenger, Grayson, Rodriguez team here as soon as we uh, finish this up. So, um, you know, something to maybe consider going forward. Okay, let's move on to Cincy and the, um, the Angels. This is the game from yesterday that was canceled, so I'll probably try and get through this pretty quickly. Graham Ashcraft, I think he's still in play. He got a $100 price drop from yesterday, and I still kind of want to go after the Angels. Uh, he's not going to be played at all, and s still similar, kind of dead range in the, you know, 8K to 9Ks. Now, Giolito on the other side got a $200 price reduction for him as well um, compared to yesterday. Still seeing a lot of ownership, and I still think it's a really dangerous spot, so I still think um, that the Reds can be in play here. Uh, and, and you can get some Pretty solid leverage, certainly 30% leverage um, on, or leverage on a 30% on pitcher, I should say, on a full 12 game slate. It's pretty attractive sometimes. And with the Reds, a couple of the guys got price reductions, notably Joey Votto. Uh, I think it, he's much more playable today than he even was yesterday. 45, I, I like this. E3 got a price bump to 3,500. Uh, not super thrilled about that. So I'd probably 
just prefer to play Votto. Um, Steer is still 5,000. Elliott is still 6,000. But McLean is down to 56, a little bit more palatable. TJ Friedel down to 47, a little bit more palatable than the 49 of yesterday. Will Benson, unfortunately, up to 36. Not stoked about that. But still very playable. He's been excellent over the last month and a half or so against right-handed pitching. Cooled off a little bit, and we got to be you know mindful of price increases, but still playable in stacks for sure. So I think the Reds are actually a little bit more playable today than they were yesterday relative uh, to their previous pricing. So um, I want to go after Julia Giolito here a little bit. I do like 9100. The relative price drop for him. Um, compared to Ashcraft, for example, well, it's a greater percentage, right? $200 uh, price drop for Giolito and just a $100 price drop for Ashcraft. Um, yeah, all right, yeah, both of these guys are in play pitching-wise for me. I don't really want to play any of the Angels again outside of Otani um, or maybe a Mickey Moniak. He got a price drop, too, down to 4000 Janual down to 25 from 26 yesterday. That's pretty much it, though. I, I don't want to really deal with this because Ashcraft's cutter, very good. I know I said I was going to um, you know, speed through this pretty quickly, but here we are. In any case, give me some Ashcraft. Otani, yeah, definitely. And some Moniac. Um, yeah, a little bit of Moniac, I suppose. A little bit of Giolito as well. Excuse me. Uh, but that's uh, pretty much it. And... You know, I'm going to play some Reds for a little bit of leverage if I can make it happen. John Gray going for Texas here in Arizona tonight. 67. I just don't trust the damn guy, man. Now, he's at a very playable price tag. We've been waiting for John Gray's price to come down all the way from the eight nine thousands where he was. So that has to put him in play. Arizona, uh, in difficult matchups, still has trouble scoring a little bit. They kind of got, um, you know, got to Texas last night in some Jordan Montgomery. John Gray, not the same quality arm anymore of Jordan Montgomery, even though he's got, you know, two and a half pretty good pitches here with the slider change curveball. Uh, fastball's still bad, right? And when John Gray is bad, he gets really, really bad. He pipes the four-seamer, and then he totally loses his changeup as well. So that means he's susceptible to both, um, you know, right-handers and left-handers when he loses the four-seamer and the change. Because after that, the slider, he just starts throwing to the damn backstop, spiking it, you know, throwing 58-foot sliders. That's no good. So when John Gray is bad, you can really go after him with Arizona. And I kind of like doing that with uh, against what I consider a mostly average arm anymore in John Gray. He's efficient early in the counts, good strike one, good chase still. CSW is still fine, so he could be serviceable down here at 6,700. I think matchup-wise, I'd probably rather take some shots on Mike Clevenger, but I think both of them are in play at, at similar price tags here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly playing either of these guys, John Gray, Mike Clevenger, as opposed to like a Wade Miley or something like that. So that's kind of how I'd like to approach it. I do want to play some Arizona. I want to play some Corbin Carroll. Got a night off last night, 5,600 is kind of jumping at you a little bit. 52 for Cattell Marte from 55 yesterday. A little attractive there. Alec Thomas kind of jumped at me, too, at 26 here. Kind of like this spot. Um, I'm not really sure why, but he kind of jumped at me. I'll have to do a little bit more research there. So some lefties uh, a little bit more so than the righties. He's still very good against right-handers, is John Gray, from a power allowed perspective. So I want to be careful with, like, a Christian Walker, Tommy Pham, Lord Scurriel type. Um, either catcher. Gabby, it'll probably be behind the plate. Could be uh, what, whoever they have, Pereira, I think. Um, I don't know. I can't keep all these you know backup catchers straight. Herrera, it's Jose Herrera. Um, and he is actually is a switch hitter, so he could be mixed in if he gets a start tonight. If you want to do that, um, so I'm not super thrilled with getting after Arizona stacks, but like I said, when John Gray's bad, he gets blown apart. Um, and Arizona, very low ownership, could be a vi super viable stack in that respect. They could put up runs in bunches because they create very well when they get going. They steal bases, um, they have power, and they have gap to you know line to line power, gap power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it's a very reasonable tournament stack pretty much any night. Get Zach Gallon is going for them at 11,000. This is kind of egregious. Uh, we talked about this in his last start or after the day after his last start, I guess, against um, San Diego, he gave up so much hard contact. It was like a super gulpy watch. 
Um, so I want to play some Texas. I played them last night, and you know they kind of got taken apart um, in a bullpen game or whatever, which is really frustrating. I'm going to go right back to it because Zach Allen gave up way too much hard contact, and hard contact is actually predictive. So um, I like taking shorts. It's super high price. Like Zach Allen's not an $11,000 arm in this particular matchup. Maybe he is from a fundamental perspective, and I kind of agree with that. I love Zach Allen, uh, but the hard contact – concerns are a major concern uh you cannot give up 080 ground balls per fly ball and 41 percent hard contact to right handers you just cannot do it so that puts Semyon, addy garcia in play uh, i once again like uh, mitch garver a little less so since these guys are kind of fly ball leans i do like addy garcia at 54 here uh gonna continue to play Corey seager because 37 percent hard contact Two left-handers with a 25% line drive rate is still very much tackable for Gallon. Um, you know, it's not so much barrel contact, but, you know, 40% hard contact, 40% hard. So you can't really, um, you know, argue against that or anything necessarily. So I want to go after it again, and I'm going to have some Texas. Um, I think you can game stack here if you can make this happen. Texas is a little harder to get to, obviously, with the top four guys that you want to play. Semi and Seager, even Nate Lowe's up to 47 tonight. Um, with some price bumps, harder to stomach a little bit. But the cheaper guys from Arizona make it work. So a game stack is in play here tonight, I think. Um Oh, yeah, yeah. If I had to choose, it's probably still just Arizona because I respect Zach Allen a hell of a lot more than I do John Gray. Um, but I also respect Texas's offense a hell of a lot more than Arizona's, uh, even though I really love the D-backs. So um, sneaky tournament game here, I think, as a, a late night hammer for you. OK, uh, last two games here, Miami, San Diego pitching mostly here, I think. But, you know, we'll get to Snell in a second. Ninety one hundred for Luzardo. Um, he's a killer tournament pivot off of Lucas Giolito at a tenth of the ownership, roughly. Um, and what I think is probably, I mean, both of the matchups are pretty difficult. Giolito is a little bit, you know, ahead in that respect, getting the Reds, because the Padres here, still against lefties, they create, man, 118 WRC plus 21.5% K rate, 10% walk rate, buck 90 ISO nearly. And neutral ground balls per fly ball, 32% hard, 341 Woba. That's kind of a big number. So it's going to be a struggle here for Jesus Luzardo. So at low ownership, he's very much in play because he has upside for strikeout stuff only. But he gives up a lot of production to righties, man. 39% hard and 080 ground balls per fly ball for him, too. Similar to Zach Gallen. 208 realized ISO allowed to the right-handers. He does have the 26% Ks. But a lot of these guys from the right side, outside of, you know, maybe like a Tatis, even Manny Machado doesn't strike out a hell of a lot against left-handers. Um, you know, I really like Bogarts here, as a matter of fact, 4400 That's a super attractive price tag for him. And like a Hassan Kim, down to 46 kind of jumping off the page at me a little bit. Gary Sanchez is probably going to stay off of that for the most part at 37 um, So maybe like a short stack here, Machado, Bogarts, Kim, or... You know, Tatis instead of Manny or something like that. I think that could be found and playable from a Padres perspective. I don't want to play any lefties here, and that includes Juan Soto. Um, and not that I think he's going to strike out at a super high clip, but so many ground balls, and Soto still hits a lot of ground balls. So uh, I want to be careful with any Padres stacks. Probably not my favorite here, but I, I do like Luzardo. 9,100, he has upside at this price tag against any lineup in baseball to blast through them because he has a lot of strikeout stuff. Um, but he's very susceptible against right-handers, so you can go after him if you choose to do so. Blake Snell, 10-7. I'm just going to come in way under. Um, I don't really like the matchup for him either, necessarily, right? The Marlins against lefties, buck 10 WRC+. plus. Maybe most of this coming from Jorge Soler. Uh, but, you know, 291 batting average? I mean, this is a huge figure here. 35% hard contact. Not a ton of power, necessarily, in aggregate, because they've got Luis Arise. You know, Brian De La Cruz, not a ton of power. You've had Yuli Gurriel and, like, Gene Segura, you know, Nick Fortes, Avi Garcia, John Birdie. You know, these guys don't hit for a lot of power necessarily, so it's mostly coming from, um, you know, the Jorge Soler, at least in the aggregate figures there. Jake Berger coming over. He's got power against lefties for sure. Still at 4,000. Still fine, but he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup. 
The only question with Snell, of course, is still the strike one. He has to get ahead of hitters. And in his last six starts, uh, well, we're seeing that sort of regress back to his his mean under 60%. It's not the 65-plus percent that he exhibited in his really strong run um, in the middle of the season, you know, June into July. The last eight starts or whatever, he's popped north of 25 one time. So the walks are starting to surface again, right? In every one of his outings over the last month and a half, uh, two walks, four, 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 five, seven, three, three, four, two. You know, the, the walk totals. Um, you know, so we got, we got to be really careful with Blake Snell. He's starting to regress back to who Blake Snell really is. And that is a guy that does not have excellent control. He just throws way too many pitches. He's a, he's at a seasonal price high now, 10,700, and he's back above 30% in ownership in a pretty difficult matchup. So no thank you with the Blake Snell. This is how I play him, and for the most part it works out pretty well for me. I get burned on occasion. Um, you know, but this is how I this is how I approach him, and I just don't like eating a lot of ownership on guys that can't throw freaking strikes. So that's how I'm going to play this, and that obviously means I'm going to try and get leverage on him too. So Georgie Soler at 5,000 flat, I'm fine with. As we talked about Berger at 4,000, fine with this also. Even a Josh Bell, you know, as a, a really off-the-board Marlin stack is okay. You want to play a Yuli Gurriel instead? I think that's probably okay too at 2,500 because he doesn't strike out at all. Um, he's just in there to make contact, and if you're playing the guys at the top of the lineup like Luis Arise, Jake Berger, uh, Solaire, Brian De La Cruz, etc. Yuli is going to be there to make contact and kind of clean things up for you a little bit. So you're not really playing him for power. Um, it's more of, you know, to hopefully just drive in some runs um, after Blake Snell walks the whole country. So that's kind of how I want to play the Marlins here tonight. You're getting 3-2 to two on them in the betting markets. I don't think this is a bad punt to take some shots against Blake Snell because this is a good team against left-handed pitching, the Marlins. Uh, I don't want to lay 9-5, to five, minus 180, against um, you know, in this or on the Padres in this particular matchup. I think the Marlins have a little bit of value here, certainly from a DFS perspective, but also into betting markets too. Okay, uh, Kansas City and Oakland, last game here. Um, Angel Zerpa is going for the Royals, 5,000, probably only going to get three innings, maybe four innings or something like that. Um, you know, they are going to, I mean, he's listed to, to, you know, start the game for him right now. Um you know, but that doesn't mean we can play him even at 5,000. I'd much rather just pay the extra thousand, get to the other, you know, 6K guys or something like that. Because on a 12-game slate, you're never really hurting for value. You can always uh, sacrifice a little bit uh, with an outfielder or something like that if you need to adjust price-wise. You don't have to eat it on a low upside pitcher like this. Uh, he does have four-seamer, uh, two-seamer slider, but he's going to go two-seamer to opposite-handed hitters here a little bit, and that's kind of dangerous. So I want to play a little bit of Asturi Ruiz, who got a price drop to 4400 today. Zach Geloff, unfortunately, got a price bump to 55 That kind of stinks. Uh, but Ryan Note is back. He'll probably be in there. Hits lefties okay, um, and Zerpa's really not going to throw it past any of these guys. So I think Oakland late-night stacks, certainly on the late slate, are very much in play as fillers or even full stacks. Brent Rooker, obviously the most power at 4,300. think that's okay. Ledmus Diaz, contact piece, third and shortstop, 2,900. Okay as well. Jonah Bride, still 2,000 if you want to play him at third base. Uh, Got to choose between you know him and Jordan Diaz, for example. But uh, plenty of playable pieces here from Oakland as singletons um, or little filler short stacks, something like that, going after on Hill Zerper. What's likely to be another kind of bullpen-ish game, so I don't want to go crazy with the Oakland exposure. This is still, you know, Oakland. Uh, but I really do like Asturi Ruiz at uh, 4,400 at the top. Hogan Harris, <clears throat> we mentioned him at the outset here, 5,900. Can't play him at this price because they're not even sure if he's going to uh, be in the game long enough, number one, because he gives up power in spades to right-handers. Um, or actually come in as the long reliever or something like that. So at 5,900, you're probably capped in upside, and I'd much rather pivot it to Grayson Rodriguez, for example. At 82 or um, 8% here, rather, projected ownership, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. I'd much rather just play 
uh, some of the other guys that we've talked about already. So um, no Hogan Harris for me. I like him against lefties. He's okay, despite a very high walk rate. He's got problems and contact problems at a full 81%, notably to the right side, as I mentioned, 230 ISO allowed there with 080 ground balls per fly ball. So we want to be careful with this. Um, and no Hogan Harris for me. You want to play some Royals? I don't really want to be playing Bobby Witt at 5,800 in Oakland tonight. I do kind of like uh, Salvi Perez, dual eligible still at uh, 4,400. I think that's fine. Freddie Fermin is okay at, at 35, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You've got some playable spots. Michael Garcia maybe is a, you know, late night type of stack. On the main slate, they're probably just going to miss the cut for me, um, even though they're popping a little bit in value score here. I'm kind of concerned. So my favorite here would probably just be Salvi, as is pretty much usual. Even though, you know, Bobby Witt's been fantastic recently. 5,800, really tough to stomach at shortstop in Oakland on a 12-game uh, slate. So that's where we are. We're done here. Let's quickly go over a review. Washington and the Yankees. I'm going to stay off of the Brodon here a little bit, or at the very least come in under. I don't really trust the guy, and I don't like the matchup. Um, I think you could get to some Washington pieces. Not thrilled about price tags necessarily. I do like Stone Garrett, Riley Adams here a little bit. Um, Lane Thomas, 52 is fine. He's got excellent numbers against left-handers. So I'm fine with that. Probably going to stay off of the Joey Manessis, 4,800. Cabert Ruiz, 39 is all right. You could find a Washington stack. Um, I'll probably try and find one, but not overly thrilled with uh, full stacks. Mostly just short pieces here for me. From Washington's perspective, same thing with the Yankees. I think JoJo can survive here because he induces so much soft contact, and the Yankees are garbage. This is a horrible team, horrible offense. They're like worse than Seattle. Um, they're going to see some ownership here today, pop in value. They're probably going to, you know, just totally destroy JoJo now that I've dogged him so hard. But uh, you know, Judge always the favorite here. Um, you know, and the Stanton price here jumping off the page a little bit, but they're not overly thrilled to be playing some Yankees here. So I'm probably just going to avoid it. And, you know, hope that high ownership there uh, burns everybody else and not me. Toronto and Baltimore, Yusei Kikuchi. I don't really want to play him tonight. I think he's still kind of expensive. He still gives up a little bit too much production to the right-handers for my liking. Um, I like Baltimore and would like to get to, like, they create a lot against left-handed pitching. Would like to get to some correlated Grayson teams as well. 6,100, I think the price tag is just too low in this particular matchup. I think he has upside there. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if he gives up some pop and a little bit of production because Toronto's still really good against right-handed pitching. But Grayson Rodriguez is a little better against right-handers than Hunter Green, for example. Um, so give me some Baltimore correlated stuff here uh, against Toronto. Really no Toronto here for me. Uh, I think it's a good matchup a little bit, kind of sneaky for Grayson. Um, from Baltimore's perspective, like some of these right-handers, Austin Hayes for sure, Ryan Mountcastle definitely. Um, you know, Santander, you know, very playable price tags for these guys. St. Louis, Pittsburgh, no way, no, uh, very little Oviedo. If you want to just take like a, a tournament correlated punt with Pittsburgh to get a little bit different with your Pittsburgh stacks, I think that's fine. But give me as much Pittsburgh as we can get. You could come off of them construction wise, cause they're still going to be pretty popular here today, but it's absolutely warranted because way is totally washed. Uh, St. Louis. Yeah. It's some lefties, maybe, um, and you can always play Aaron on Goldschmidt, but not overly thrilled with St. Louis here tonight, to be quite honest. Uh, Dodgers, give me all of them. They're my favorite stack for sure. Um, getting Syndergaard over here is also totally washed. I don't want anything to do with him. Very little Cleveland, probably a Josie Ramirez, uh, something like that. Maybe a Stephen Kwan one-off or whatever against Bobby Miller. But I like correlated teams here a little bit with Bobby Miller too. Um, him and Ashcraft in the 8K range, I, I, I like it. You know, those price tags, 86 and 84, I believe, Ashcraft. So give me all of the Dodgers as much as I can get here. Uh, Mets, Atlanta, maybe short Mets stacks, but I don't like going after high ground ball pitchers like Elder. I guess at 83, it's going to put him in play, but I'd rather play Miller and I'd rather play Ashcraft, I think, uh, as opposed to Bryce Elder here against the Mets, who are still going to make contact. Um, so kind of difficult there. Atlanta is the number two stack, certainly against Tyler McGill. I want to be careful, though. They're just more expensive than the Dodgers, so give me the Dodgers instead. Field probably going to... Um, think similarly though however uh but i do like um who was it? eddie rosario 4000 uh, is pretty attractive there i think my favorite price adjusted play from the braves minnesota and milwaukee bailey over yeah sure i don't really want to play a lot of offense here necessarily over is still kind of expensive and at low ownership i think this is fine um i think he's got some upside here but we want to be a little bit careful because he's expensive 
and he has a pretty severe split against left-handers and gives up a lot of raw power and fly balls to right-handers. So he's susceptible for sure. Um, no Milwaukee or Wade Miley or anything for me. Maybe a couple of Twins pieces here or there because they're well-priced. Going after, I just want a homer hunt really against Wade Miley. I don't really want to stack Minnesota because they're bad. Boston and Houston, Tanner Houck. I want lefties for Houston against him. I don't really want to play him at all. Um, so not thrilled about full Houston sacks here tonight. Uh, I was a little bit on the, you know, on them a little bit more, I should say, uh, last night. Um, even though I really wasn't on them a whole hell of a lot. Uh, Verlander, sure, 9,500. I think this is okay as well, going after a little bit of Boston. But I want to be careful, man. I still respect this offense. I think you can find a Boston stack here or there, too. Their prices are more palatable today than they were yesterday. So um, getting after a little bit of Verlander, I think both sides are in play there. Seattle and the White Sox. Brian Wu is in play. We've got to be careful. Got to be aware that we're eating some risk um, with you know some forearm shenanigans here. Uh, but price-wise and, and fundamentally, it's a pretty damn good spot against the White Sox. I want to play it, though. I'll play more of him if the White Sox come out with, you know, seven righties or something in the lineup uh, or whatever. Um, I think that'd, that'd be a really damn good spot to jump on board, assuming he, you know, doesn't come out in the second inning with a sore elbow. Uh, Clevenger on the other side, I think he's also playable at 6,600. Um, I think you could argue that against Seattle, even though they've been much better recently, like, you got to be careful here. He gives up a lot of fly balls. And Julio is a ground ball hitter, so he's going to be back tonight, having gotten a day off yesterday. And at 5,500, I'm still kind of scared of him. Uh, but everybody else, yeah, I'm okay kind of taking some shots on Clevenger. I prefer uh, Rodriguez, of course, but um, not out of the question to play some Clevenger here, at least for me. Since he and the Angels, Ashcraft, very little of the Angels. Uh, Otani, mostly for me. Um, and some Red Stacks, getting some leverage off of Giolito, I think are very much in play. Have some Giolito, sure, because he still has upside to pick through Cincinnati. But they're a little bit more playable today than they were yesterday, uh, at least for me. Texas, I want to play again against Zach Gallon. I want to stack against Zach Gallon um, because he's giving up way too much hard contact. I, I cannot stomach that. Uh, it's just way too much and way too many fly balls against right-handers. So the right-handers, the left-handers um, are all really in play, at least for me. And I'm going to take some shorts on this $11,000 price tag. I think it's too high, certainly in this matchup. And Arizona as well, targeting John Gray. When he's bad, he's very bad. Uh, and this is still a pretty good offense over here. So I think they're playable price-wise. Not my favorite, um, you know, but very sneaky tournament game here. Miami and San Diego, Luzardo, really good tournament pivot off of Giolito, where he was uh, up here. And a little bit of Erlander, too, but he gives up a boatload of production to right-handers. So uh, favorites would probably just be Bogarts, Hassan Kim from the Padres, um, and then mix in Machado or uh, Tatis or whatever. Full stack's hard to get to uh, from the Padres because Luzardo still has a lot of swing and miss, but he's very susceptible there. Um, good tournament play from a price perspective and an ownership perspective, though. Blake Snell, I'm just going to come in under. Uh, I want to play Bailey over instead, um, uh, above 10,000 if I'm getting there. So no thanks on the on the heavy, heavy ownership. I'll have a little bit, uh, but this is a horrible matchup, I think. And, and leverage stacks for, for Miami, absolutely in play. Casey and Oakland, Angel Zerpa and Hogan Harris, no pitching for from either of these guys for me. And a little bit of Oakland and maybe some Salvi from Kansas City. So we're done here. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership pushes as always. And good luck to everybody here on this, uh, what day is it? Tuesday, 12 Gamer.